Hi guys, can you, can you, can you hear me? Excellent, okay. So, uh, as you guys just found out, I'm not an astronomy student, um, so I'm not gonna tell you anything about my research. Uh, instead, I'm gonna try to tell you a story that's actually many hundreds of years old, and I'm gonna try to squeeze it into the next 15 minutes. So, it's, it's gonna, so I'm gonna start with 18,000 years ago. So, um, these are the Lascaux Caves, and these are some of the oldest cave paintings Actually, the first cave paintings are, that are definitely a map. Um, and so to you, it might not look like a map, but to astronomers who know constellations really well, they see that it perfectly matches up with stars. So uh, I thought that this would be an appropriate place to start an astronomy talk about maps and navigation. And uh, you can see it in this picture, but it's arguably the first ever astronomy paper, and it was actually titled Homo sapien et al. right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, okay, so let's get forward much closer to us, to the third century BC. And there's this guy, Eratosthenes. He was a philosopher, and he was the first guy to propose a system of latitude and longitude, which we still use today. Um, he was also, I added the second tidbit, he uh, measured the circumference of the Earth. So there's a common misconception that in the Middle Ages, people didn't know that the Earth was round. Um, that's wrong. Ancient Greeks knew that the world was round. And he was the one who measured it in a really clever way. So look that up if you guys are interested. So, but he proposed a system of latitude and longitude. And now we have to know, so we're somewhere out at sea and we want to know where we are. So let's first figure out how to measure latitude. So you can use it, you, well, this thing is called the sextant. And using this thing, you can find your uh, latitude. So what a sextant does is it measures angles between two distant objects. So what you can do, is so you're sitting here on Earth, this is Earth, and it's spinning in this direction, so this is its axis, and up here is Polaris, uh, or the North Star. And the reason it's called the North Star is because this is our axis, and our axis points directly to it. So as we spin around the Earth, its position in the sky doesn't change. So uh, that means that uh, if you're somewhere on Earth, for example, you're right here, and you have your handy-dandy sextant, so the light from Polaris is coming in here, and you measure the angle between Polaris and the horizon with your sextant, and uh, that angle will give you your latitude. So the way you can visualize this is, imagine you're sitting on the equator, right? North lies directly along the horizon. So Polaris is gonna be right along the horizon, right there, and your angle would be zero. You would be at zero degrees north. If you're sitting up here uh, on the North Pole, uh, the axis of the Earth goes straight through you, so Polaris would be right above you, and you would be at 90 degrees north. And this works for all the points in between as well. So, calculating latitude is easy. People have known this for a really long time. So now, uh, let's calculate longitude, and this will be a really short talk. Um, it turns out it's not so easy. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'm going to start my how we figured out how to calculate longitude with something called the Silly Naval Disaster. Um, yeah, it uh, happened in the Isles of Scilly. So the British Navy was returning from a very successful uh, campaign, uh, and they, the Scilly, uh, so the Scilly, Isles of Scilly, are right at the entrance to the English Channel. So they were almost home, and they got caught in a storm. They miscalculated uh, their position because they didn't know their longitude, and they crashed onto these rocks. So the Isles of Scilly are known for being really hard to navigate. They crash onto these rocks, which you can tell are really far out from the sea, and four ships sank, tons of people died, and uh, it was a huge disaster. Uh, it's, apparently, it's the biggest single naval disaster for the British Navy to this day. Uh, and this prompted the following. So, the Longitude Act of 1714, when uh, a board of longitude was created, and this board of longitude was to evaluate proposals for how to... Uh, how to discover longitude, and they offered huge prizes, and they had a ton of submissions, all of which were absolute trash. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the thing is, people have actually known, in theory, how to calculate longitude for a really long time, actually since the second century BC, and the way it works is roughly like this. So, you're going on a voyage, you start here, you look at your, uh, you know what time it is, because you can look up at the stars and you know your local time, and you take your watch and you calibrate it with your local time. Then you sail over here, and so here, 
you know it's noon because the sun is right above you. And you know, based on your clock, you know that at this, right now it's 3 p.m. over here. So the Earth takes a full 24 hours to do a full rotation, right? Hence we can, so that's why we have 24 time zones now. So because it takes a full 24 hours to do a full rotation, that means that we, you have traveled one eighth of the Earth, or 45 degrees in longitude. Uh, so this was invented in the second century BC, so what's the problem? You can, you just take a clock or you do some complicated thing with astronomy. So let's look at the easy option, let's take a clock. So um, now it becomes a talk about clocks in the 18th century. Uh, this is a clock, uh, I'm not sure that, this one is actually newer, but it's a pendulum clock. And the problem with pendulum clocks, so one, they're accurate to a couple of seconds a week, which was, meh, okay. Um, but the problem is if you put a pendulum clock on a boat that rocks, uh, this would be a very optimistic figure. So uh, let's see what astronomers came up with in the meantime. So uh, astronomers have actually figured things out for before the Board of Longitude. So the first proposal was this astronomer Johannes Werner from uh, 1514, and he calculated something called lunar distance. So the idea is, if we can't uh, put, have a clock that works at sea, why don't we look for clocks in the sky? And the easiest clock to spot in the sky is the moon. So uh, as the moon uh, rotates past the background stars, it passes by various stars. And using some very complicated equations, you can predict when it passes by certain stars. And based off of its distance from specific bright stars in the sky, you can calculate uh, local time in a specific place, specifically Greenwich, where our uh, zero, uh, line of zero longitude passes through. So they wrote up giant tables of how to convert these measurements into the time at Greenwich, and then you know how far you are from Greenwich. Um, the problem is, one, these are some really complicated calculations, and at the time that this was proposed, it would take a trained person about four hours to do these calculations. They didn't have calculators yet. Um, and then the other problem is, it's kind of, you have to measure from the center of the moon, but that's kind of hard. So uh, this wasn't a very good method. Uh, but this was the best thing we had until uh, Galileo came along. So Galileo is known for stealing the invention for the telescope and being the first one to actually point it up in the sky. And one of the first things he saw was Jupiter and its four moons. So he was the first one. These are called the Galilean moons of Jupiter. They're the four brightest objects orbiting Jupiter. He measured them in 1612, and he uh, made these observations. Um, are there any people from U of M in the crowd? University of Michigan? Thank you, one person. So this paper, uh, I, I graduated from University of Michigan, and this paper uh, is housed in our library. So I've seen it in person. It's really cool. Um, so, but these are his actual observations of the moons of Jupiter, and you do the same thing. You can predict where the moons of Jupiter will be with respect to each other at various times, and then you can translate it into what the time is at Greenwich. So, uh, this was great, but the problem is you can't really look at Jupiter from a telescope from a moving ship because the ship is swaying and, yeah. So, uh, in comes John Harrison. John Harrison, he was a carpenter by trade. His dad was a carpenter. He was trained in carpentry, and he was, became interested in uh, clock making at a pretty early age. He was from a little village in England. He had no real formal education. Uh, and so the first, uh, by the time he was in his early 20s, he made a pendulum clock. So this is actually the inside of the pendulum clock that he made that uh, was drifted by only a second a month, which is much better than a few seconds a week. Um, after he made a few of these clocks, he started focusing on the longitude prize. So uh, this is his first design. Uh, this is his second design. They were taken to sea trials and they did pretty well. So at this point, I'm going to try to explain what's different between these things and pendulum clocks. And the thing, the thing is different is the mechanism that actually ticks that keeps the time are these golden things here. And the way they work is like this. So you have two masses that, so these two masses rotate around this point, these two masses rotate around this point, and they're rubber, or not rubber bands, um, springs, thank you. <laughs> uh, there are springs between them. So they do this, back and forth, back and forth. So 
the idea is actually quite genius. If you take this thing and suddenly drag it to the side, as I drag it to the side like you, uh, this would mess up a pendulum clock, but all the forces on all of these uh, pendulums cancel out, uh, on all of these masses cancel out. So nothing happens, the clock still keeps time. You can also take it and rotate it around the center all of a sudden. So if you give it a torque around the center, the torque on one of these bars will cancel out with the torque on the other bars. They're connected here, so they are uh, always in sync with each other. And uh, that also cancels out. So why do I have the words the problem here? Uh, so does anyone know how to sail in the crowd? OK, a few people. So you guys are familiar with when you go upwind, you have to tack, right? And when you tack, so the boat leans over on one side and then suddenly flips and starts leaning over on the other side and it's very uncomfortable for anyone trying to sleep. Um, and when you tack, this is what happens to your clock. And so if you add these vectors, you'll see that this bar twists in this direction, this one twists in this direction, that doesn't cancel out. So John Harrison, who was a perfectionist, realized this and even though they performed pretty well in sea trials, he trashed the whole idea and spent 19 years working on this. So this is H3. Uh, there are, it's really complicated. This is H3 with the front taken off. And uh, it used these rotating disks instead of these pendulums connected by springs. But it turns out it was really hard to keep these rotating disks in sync with each other. Um, so at this point, John Harrison didn't, he, the Board of Longitude wanted to take these, this clock to sea trials, but John Harrison refused because he was a perfectionist. And he decided to start focusing, instead of using these big metal disks, he thought we should use smaller ones. So he started focusing on pocket watches. So pocket watches in Europe were something that rich people bought to show off. They were accurate to only about an hour a day in the beginning. Many of them didn't have minute hands. And they were just a luxury item. Uh, however, John Harrison teamed up with a pocket watch maker and made this beautiful thing. So, this is H4, and this is the first ever marine chronometer. This is the dial, and this is what's behind the dial. So uh, this was his final design, and he let it go to sea trials. At this point, he was in his late 60s, so he sent his son, William Harrison, to Jamaica. So they sailed to Jamaica with astronomers, and William Harrison measured uh, the lo a specific location in Jamaica, the astronomers confirmed it using the Galilean moons method. And it turns out that J William Harrison was only three miles off from the location that the astronomers measured. So, uh, so this would be a happy end, but it wouldn't be a good story without villains. So after I uh, name who the villains are, I don't think I'll be invited back, but this is Newton, this is Haley. Uh, these are probably the two more famous people who were on the Board of Longitude at various times. There were tons of other famous astronomers on the Board of Longitude, and they weren't happy that a guy with no formal education, who was just a clockmaker and a carpenter, managed to come up with something. So they said, okay, it happened by accident, do it again. So William Harrison sailed back, sailed to Jamaica again, measured uh, the position again, was again within three miles. And they said, no, you, what, you have, what happened is you magically made one clock where all the errors cancel out. There's no way you can do it again. At this point, John Harrison was getting very old and very tired of this and very angry. So he made H5 and didn't give it to the Board of Longitude, but gave it directly to King George III, who we recently celebrated on the 4th of July. Um, so. King George III, uh, you know, as all benevolent monarchs, uh, thought that John Harrison was treated really unfairly. So he ordered the Board of Longitude to give the prize to John Harrison. So here's a happy end. John Harrison was awarded the, Board of, uh, the Longitude Prize in 1773. He was 80 years old at that time. John Harrison died three years later. Um, so marine chronometers were still really expensive. So people used lunar distance for... Uh, a very long time. And then in the 20th century, uh, radio stations were invented and they started broadcasting local time signals. So now I'm going to tell you a slight aside about this. Uh, you guys are familiar with what this is. Um, three of these fit in the ice cube as we just learned. Uh, so uh, 
the Eiffel Tower was actually built for the World Fair of 1893, I'm pretty sure. And uh, it was only supposed to stay up for 20 years. Uh, but the, the architect behind the Eiffel Tower really wanted it to stay up longer. So he started doing various experiments on the Eiffel Tower. At that time, it was the tallest building in the world, so he started doing various weather measurements at the top. Um, but none of that was really interesting to anyone until in 1910, a, a radio station was installed in the Eiffel Tower. It was the first radio station that twice a day would broadcast local Parisian time to everywhere in the world. It had two effects. One was uh, that rich people could synchronize their clocks with the clock in Paris and felt fancy. And the other effect was that ships all across the world started using this and that is why the Eiffel Tower is still up today. So um, yeah, thanks for coming. This is a picture of how our world looks like since 1995, I'm pretty sure, when GPS was made public. So we don't have to deal with all that complicated stuff. And if you have any questions, please ask. Thank you, Ilya, the illest. What? We have time for some questions. Oh, up there. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, a sexton does work in the summer, southern hemisphere. It's more complicated. So in the southern hemisphere, we don't have uh, Polaris. We have something called the southern void. And so you have to try to figure out where this center of the southern void is by looking at where other stars point. So there's a famous, there are two actually famous constellations. There's a southern cross and there is a constellation that looks like a sextant which point towards where, yeah, where the southern center of the southern void is. Right there. So, the, yeah, there are, uh, there are other ways. So, using when the sun is at zenith is the most easy thing to visualize, but you also can convert positions of various stars at, in different seasons to what your local time is. Uh, so, that's what they, they actually, that's actually more accurate because unlike the sun, which is a very big, bright thing that takes up a big part of the sky, uh, one star is a single point, and that's much more accurate. So that's what, what they would actually use. In front. So they didn't know that yet. Um, but, but they, so you don't, right, there's a consistent delay between, or actually it's not very consistent. Good. Uh, so the, the question was, did they have to take in the uh, time the light travels from Jupiter to us and to the calculations. And I realize I'm not very sure that that would give some sort of error because during different times of their orbit, we are different distances from Jupiter. Do, do the astronomers in the audience have a? Yes? I would say they probably didn't know. And then when we figured it out, they solved some errors. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Your guess is as good as mine. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, if not, let's thank Ilya the Illis again.